as Rob said in the very intro, you guys, as he welcomed you guys, our purpose for gathering on Sundays. We don't do it because it's ritual. We don't want it to be just a destination or just something you have to do. We want to offer it as an opportunity for you to carve out time to hear from and to speak to God. We believe from the very core of our being that when we gather, God is here. And that God's power is evident and that God's presence is expected. And we, we operate that way. And so we take times on Sundays to gather so that we can hear from Him through worship, through conversation with each other, through the message given, and a time for us to, to speak to Him through praise, through prayer. Because it's important as we gather that we have the, that dynamic of having a conversation with our friend. And so um, I'm glad that you're here. We've been going through this uh, series called Stories, as you guys have taught, heard already. And, our, and, our, and the whole purpose of Stories has been we believe that and we know that stories really can interact with us and really reach our soul in a far deeper way than many other ways of communication. You know, listing things or just giving a, a bunch of guidelines or rules do not reach the deeper level of our mind and heart and soul as does a story. You know, you think about some of the greatest stories that you read or you, you're reading. They just kind of envelop you, draw you into them, and you almost begin to experience them firsthand. Um, there's many stories like that, and that's the purpose of us going through stories. We've gone and talked about through stories of triumph. We've talked about stories of sadness and stories of, of trials and stories of love. We've moved through these stories. And every one of the stories, our goal has been that you would place yourself in the shoes of the people moving through those stories firsthand. That you just won't read it as a spectator from a distance. That you will allow it to embrace you and you'll move into that story. Because I believe that when we move into those stories that God has recorded in His Scripture and His Word, we do a couple things. First of all, we get to see God in a very real and a very full way. We, people can tell you about God and people can give you uh, descriptions of God, but when you can experience God for yourself, it's a completely different experience. We get a chance every time we gather, every time we hear a story, whether you're here at church or you at your own home or someplace where you can just be alone, when you read a story in God's Word, you're stepping into the presence of God and getting to know Him. Not only do we get to experience God, but second, we get to walk in the shoes of the characters. We get to kind of see how what they did, the choices they made, and the experience that they have. And ultimately, here's our goal. Here's the reason that we chose to go with stories. That each of us, when we walk for a time, for 20, 30 minutes with these characters, that we will be inspired to walk out those doors to live the life that, that, that they chose to live or they chose not to live and to, to experience how maybe they did something that was wrong and we installed that and we say, you know what, let me learn from that. But ultimately, we may, all of us may walk out inspired to live the life God has called each of us to live. That's the purpose. And so we've gone through all these stories and Adam and Eve, we kind of saw who God was, the God of love, and yet even though man had rebelled against God and kind of said, no, God, I don't trust you, we still see a God that pursued and loved them despite their failure. And then we look forward, we can see the next story, which was the story of Abraham and Lot, remember, and in that story, I see God speaking that there needs to be people who are passionately burdened about a city. As Abraham was like, God, man, will you, will you rescue him for this many? And, and begin to just almost bargain with God. God, and, and, and here's the truth. God didn't want to bargain. God wanted to say that say just as much as Abraham did. He wanted to get down like you just can find ten. And we understood that if Lot and just his family had been living the way that God had called them to live, that whole city would have been saved. And how that God's calling you and me to be in the city that we're placed. And to, be a, and to be have a burden for the city and to be crying out for the city and to live a life that, that will rescue and redeem the city through Christ. So that's what we learned about God and, and what He wants for us. And um, Abraham and Lot and Joseph, we saw the story of that when God is silent, when our life seems to go the very opposite direction of maybe the promises or the things we've heard about God. We've heard all these great promises that God speaks over you and that God speaks for you. But when your life looks the exact opposite of those promises and it seems that it's not just getting, it's going, it's getting worse. The hold on. God's moving on your behalf. What He asks for us is to be faithful and to trust Him through our darkest pits and prisons. Because God is on the move. He's got something He wants to do great. He wants to use you. We saw that. And then as uh, Michael spoke about Moses and 
And just seeing a man that had passion and wanted to, and wanted to actually seek justice for the wrongs of the world. And, and on his own, he just felt frustrated. He always came to dead ends when he wanted to pursue his passions. But when he finally understood that those passions that were boiling up in him were the same passions that God had. And he, and he realized that in God's hands, those passions could be for redemption and not for death. And, and you know what? That's what speaking is meant. Whatever your passion, what, what do you see in society that the ills, the injustices, the things that really burden you? And God said, in, in, invite, come with me, because with me, we can do something about those injustices. On our own, we'll just make it worse. But with me, I've got a plan for redemption. We see that. We see that clearly in the story of Moses. We saw the next story was the story of the mighty men. Did you guys, some of you, it's one of the smaller stories, one of my favorite stories. These, these guys are just the, the tough dudes of the Bible, man. They are the, they're the Navy SEALs. They're the Delta Force. These guys are people you don't want to mess with. And, they, and the story was just, ultimately we saw in that was this, that, that God was looking for some people to be willing to stand up. Jesus said, look for a among them and make up a hedge and stand in the gap. And he said he found none. It's kind of the same story of who's willing to, everybody else is going to run. Everybody else is scared, but who's going to stand up and stand up and fight for our city? This is why we exist, Radius. We don't exist just to gather. We want you to gather. We want you to be inspired. We want you to have a conversation with God. But our greatest desire is that you do not let it stay here, that it moves outside that door. And you, and you live it in your workplaces and with your friends and in your neighborhoods. Because it's, it's not in here necessarily that people need to see Jesus. And, and they will, thank God, because Jesus is here. But they need to see Him where they're at. You know our mission statement is to move out in ever-widening circles. To change our world. To move out in the radius is moving out from the center and moving out to the perimeter. Meeting people where they are in life. Showing and being the tangible love of Jesus. Because in that we experience and demonstrate the hope of who Jesus is. We live it. We don't want religion. We want relationship. We want to live and move out and be Jesus to the people of this community. Then last week we talked about just talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. One of my favorite stories of the Old Testament. And we saw in that story, as you put yourself in those shoes, that when you stand and do what's right for God, it sometimes goes worse before it gets better. But don't let your present circumstances dictate what you know to be true about the God that we serve. I do sometimes, don't you? I believe God, I believe this for God, I believe this about God, and yet when my circumstances begin to rise up and say the opposite, I am tempted to allow to change my mind how I see God. That He is loving and all-powerful and He is the God of grace and strength. And I begin to question Him. And it is a natural tendency for us humans. But we see it in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Even though when they're a fiery furnace, they did not quite, they trusted and surrendered their life. And what do we find? We found at the end of that story, and, you know, I was going to say, if you haven't heard one of the messages, you can check it out online, but I just told you all of them. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that the only thing, when they fell into the fire and when they walked out, there was only one thing that were touched by the fire. Their, their clothes were not singed. They didn't even smell like smoke. Come on. Have you been, been around a campfire lately? I mean, you're going to smell like smoke. They walked out smelling nothing like smoke. The only thing that was touched, the Bible makes it very clear, were the ropes that the, that the enemy had bound them with. And when we go through hard times, when we go through fiery trials, let's stop asking where God is because God was walking with them in the trial. Stop asking that question. Start asking, God, what are you trying to burn off of my life? Because what you're trying to burn off is the one that is going to free me to live. Woo! That, that gives me hope because there's some fiery trials that we go through. There are dark days that approach us. And if we, if we spend all of our time asking God, where are you? We will miss the very reason God is with us to burn off anything that hinders us from moving out for Him with passion. And so we talk about the day we talk about, I mean, these are all great stories in there. And by the way, I encourage you to pick up the Bible yourself and begin to read because there are so many more stories that are as cool and even cooler than those. I encourage you to begin to read the Word of God and look at it in a fresh new way as God wants to speak to you through the stories. Today we go with the last one to call it the greatest story because really it is a part of the greatest story. We're going to talk about, you guys know, in traditional church this is what we call Palm Sunday. They call it Palm Sunday because... Uh, traditionally, this is the day that Jesus walked into Jerusalem. All of his disciples were behind him. All the city cheering him, putting down palm leaves, putting down their coats, 
praising Jesus because they think something's about ready to happen. They're, they're like, finally this guy's going to take over, going to kick Rome out, and we're going to set up our kingdom. It's going to be awesome. And they're just praising God, saying, Hosanna, this is it. This is finally what we're looking for. And we're going to look at the story, and we're going to talk about just a couple things about the story when we're done. The first thing I want to kind of talk about the story is this is just a part of a bigger story. There's more to the story here. I want you guys to turn, if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 12. If you don't have your Bibles, it'll be up on the screen. John chapter 12, and we're going to read 12 through 19. John chapter 12, 12 through 19. I'll get there real quick. I got a cheat sheet. I got my little tabs. I'm like, man, he got there quick. I marked it, all right? John chapter 12. Starting in verse 12, the next day the Jews that the news uh, next day the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet them. They shouted, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophet that said, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. This little side fact in the Old Testament, if you would think the king would be riding on a stallion, but in that tradition in Jewish history, a king rode on a donkey. That was a symbol of the king coming back in and a king of victory. And so we see this. And so they, they, they did not fall on deaf ears or on blind eyes when they see Jesus walking and riding into the capital city on a donkey. His disciples didn't understand the time that there was fulfilling a prophecy. But after Jesus entered his, into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that things had been written about him. First little point that, hmm, there's more going on here than just a, a guy riding in on his own. Me and the crowd had seen Jesus called Lazarus from the tomb, raising from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. Again, another little phrase. It's a little snippet, but to me it says there's something deeper going on there. Who is these, these evil characters off the side kind of uh, disfuster? They've lost their power. That it's, it's over. There's this deeper story there. There's a deeper story of this guy who just raised from right the dead. There's, when we get into the story, if we just stood here in Palm Sunday, and so many times we do it as a church, we focus on a part of the story, the part of Jesus coming and, and dying on the cross, right? And that's, that's, it's an important part. But if we focus there, we do disservice to the greater, grander story that's happening. It's like going into any great book. If you, you know, read Narnia, which, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia are on the Witch and the Wardrobe, and you went straight to the chapter where Aslan, who represents God, comes to the stone tat table and lays down his life and shaves his mane and, and is killed by the wicked witch, right? You come into that part of the story, and you're like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. But if you don't see that, if you don't understand there's a greater story, there's something much bigger, much deeper going on. You miss the power of the greatest story. And so today we were not going to just focus on this. There's something greater going on because, you see, this is we're taking a snapshot into a story that started from the very beginning of time. Remember when we talked about Adam and Eve? We talked at the beginning, and a lot of times we say, you know, how can God create a place that's so evil and so bad? And if you know the full story, you know that God created a perfect place in a perfect environment. No sin and no curse. This was, his, this was his desire. His desire was to live intimately with you and me. For us to see him. They, with Adam and Eve in the very beginning, Jesus stood and walked with them every afternoon. Don't you wish you could... I mean, sometimes in my life I wish I could see Jesus and just see him and talk to him physically. That was God's plan. A perfect world. No sin, no curse, no death, no destruction, no pain. And yet... If we don't know that there was a bigger story, that God had the beginning of a story that's far different than the part we are in now, we miss out on what God's intentions were. God seems so evil. God seems so, I don't care. We don't understand because we look at the pain and the suffering. But yet we need to understand that God's story is far much greater. And then we see that Adam and Eve chose to not trust God and chose their own way. And there begin, in, in stories, there's the intro and then there's the, the original, um, I think of the had a phrase for it. Do you guys know the story structure? Am I know that English teachers? In I have it written down. Is the complication? The complication arose. The complication in the garden when the enemy began to whisper, "You can't trust God. God's not good." And man chose sin, and because sin, it became a curse, and it 
It just didn't curse man. It cursed the earth. And the reason we deal with so much national and, and disasters and these things is because the sin curse has been spread just as a virus through the world. And, and, and what it ultimately did was it separated. Here became the problem in the story. God, who loved man, had, a, had a, a vision to see God and man together forever in complete fellowship. The sin curse separated God from man. We chose sin, and when we chose sin, there was a gap. There was a, almost, you could almost say a vision that separated me between me and God. And I chose it. And according to Romans, because Adam and Eve chose it, it was passed. That sin curse was passed to you and me down the line. We were born separated from God because of our sin. We see, we can look at every story that we've told and the many other stories. We can see examples of that. Adam and Eve broke the perfect love and had relational problems because of it. There was murder. The mighty men were there because there was war. Shadrach, Meshach, and were in bondage and slave to another land. Why? All these things happen because there was these small things that begin to happen when the world began to unravel because the sin curse was a problem. But as you know, any great story, the story comes to a play for us at the climax, where it's the part of the story when all, when the main problem of the story is finally solved. You see, the greatest story about Jesus didn't happen when he was born in a manger. The story started in the garden and for thousands of years moved through God loving and pursuing people. If you look at every story in the Old Testament, you see two things. You see man messed up. You see man hurting. And you see God still pursuing. You see God using men and women that were not perfect. I don't know if you've been in a church where you feel like you've got to be perfect to be used by God, but you could, the Old Testament and New Testament is chalked full of people who are broken, who are messed up, who are hurting, and sometimes out and out rebellious against God. Yet God's grace pursued them even then. But there was still a problem because there was still a main problem. There was still the gap. No one could fill the gap. Because we were broken and God was holy. And there was nothing in the middle. And no matter how hard we tried, no matter how religious we got, no matter how good we got, no matter how good service acts we did, it never could bridge the gap. And the story, the greatest story is about bridging the gap, bringing it back to the day when God spoke the world into existence and man walked side by side. That was from the beginning what the story was. That was his passion. There's a greater part of the story here. We see it. This right there, we rob the story of its of its magic. We rob the story of its power and its beauty. We just take a snapshot of this part. <clears throat> yes, it's Palm Sunday. But that King Jesus riding in on a donkey was just an act, a part of the story that was far greater. Not only is there more parts of the story, but also there's a climax, as I said. As I said, there's different elements. There's the introduction of the characters, the complication of the problem. The middle of the Bible story, which is the series of events where the characters continue to struggle with the main problem, being separated from God. And only comes the climax of the story where, the, where it finally is resolved. You see, in the, old, in the body of the story, as you read the Bible, God chose Israel. He chose Abraham, remember? Abraham and Lot. He chose Abraham and He chose to use them as the nation that He would use to demonstrate His power to the world. He was still about trying to reach the world through Israel. It's an amazing fact, I don't know if you know this, but Israel was placed in every major uh, kingdom that lived from Assyria all the way down to Rome. They were always thrust into the middle of it because God was still about moving and trying to place Him in the center of the great world dominations. And He was still trying to reach the world. You remember Jonah the whale? You know who he was trying to reach after Assyria, the, the kingdom that was before Babylon. He threw him to Nineveh. God was passionate about reaching the world. And He chose, he chose Israel. Yeah, there was still that problem with sin curse. And so he, he, there was going to be a day when the climax would come, when the story would all come to be. But until then, God said, you know what you need to do? You need to, you need to kill a lamb every year, and that blood of that innocent lamb will be poured on the altar, and it will cover, it will cover the sins of the people for one year. It's a one-year expiration day. All the sins, all the brokenness, all the failures, you and me, how we feel it, every brokenness, and was covered by the, the blood of the Lamb being slain. Which brings us to a point when John, John looks at Jesus and he's, he, he hints of a bigger story. 
The first time he sees Jesus, you guys, if you have your Bibles, if not, you can turn there. It's in um, um, John 1, 29 and 30. This is the first time John sees Jesus walking to him. And he whispers because John gets that there's a bigger, deeper story going on. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look! The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. I love that. Could you imagine sitting there? John was a really uh, looked up to guy. kind of a, a preacher type uh, evangelist. Everybody thought, man, this guy has got it. So he would follow him. He was like the top guy. And one day, they're looking at John, listening to John. John looks at a guy named Jesus, an ugly, carpenter, rough, Character. The Bible says you didn't look at Jesus and think he was good looking. He was just a normal guy. No more Jewish fellow who had spent 30 years with his parents and working as a carpenter. And he looks and points to him and says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now that to us we hear that, oh, that's pretty interesting. But that caused almost a, a seismic ripple to the people around them because they had heard for centuries about that. Yeah, we know the Lamb. The Lamb has to die and cover the sins of the world. And he says, Look, I'm going to tell you there's a bigger story here. This guy who's coming, he was before me. He existed before I ever was around. And he is the one that won't just cover your sins. He is the one that will solve the climax of the story. He is the one that will take away the sins of the world. And next week we're going to look at people didn't like that story. People were comfortable with religion because religion can control people. Religion can put people up on a pedestal and people like that. And so the world, the religion did not want someone to say, Hey, you don't have to follow a man. You can follow God Himself and He has come in a person named Jesus and He has come so you can be friends. He has solved the conflict of the story. Because when Jesus died, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no payment for sin. So Jesus, who was the perfect Lamb of God, who was God Himself in flesh, came. And when He died on the cross, when He shed His blood, He did not just cover the sins for the year. He took every sin of every individual that has ever lived and ever will live and put it on His shoulders and carried that burden on the cross. You see, when he, before he got there, and we'll talk about it a little bit next week, he said, I, Lord, if this is not your will, then I, I, you know, if this is your will, I'll do it, but please let this cup pass from me. I, he was a, let me get something real, Jesus was not a weak guy. He was a strong man, he was a carpenter. I mean, one day he made a whip out of rope and drove everybody out of the temple. He is somebody that was, you know, you, you didn't mess with him. But he was burned because he understood that he was going to take on him Every sin has ever been committed. The burden only God Himself can carry. So the climax of the story is that day when Jesus stood up and, and gave Himself and died on the cross and shed His blood and took my place and your place and took the punishment the wrath of God that Bible says was poured out on him. His death on the cross bridged the gap. And Jesus became the way to restore the relationship between me and you and God. And he doesn't ask for religion or rules. He asks for relationship. Trust me. John 14 says, I, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to God except through me. He wasn't being narrow-minded. He was saying, look, I have done it. You don't have to search anywhere else. I took care of it. I am the bridge. Accept me. Accept who I am. Accept what I did. And welcome a relationship because I am desperate. I've died to have a relationship with you. Quit playing games. Quit just going to church. Quit just trying to be good enough. Say, I'm not good enough. I am broken. I need your relationship. I need what you did for me, Jesus. So that's the climax of the story. It is a great part. And next week we're going to look at the end. But let me tell you this. this is, that was not the end of the story. For most of our story, we'd say if death came, that would be the end of the story for the main character. But here's the beautiful thing. We end with this. 
the story is not over. Hmm. Whoo, that's good. The story's not over. The story's not over because Jesus didn't stay in that grave. You see, Jesus died for the sins, but three days later, as we, read, we talk about next week, He conquered death and hell and the grave for you and me. 1 Corinthians, I think we have 1 Corinthians um, 15, 54-57 says this. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For the sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, through Jesus' victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, there's death, there's sting and death. Isn't there? When someone we love passes or when we face the shadow of death ourselves, it's hard. But we understand that Jesus faced the shadow, went through death, and conquered it for us. We have hope because He conquered death for us. It's not the end. The story is not ending either. You understand that God invites you and me into the story. There, can you, there's not a more epic story than this. The start of the very beginning of time and move through all the great characters and all the great stories we read. And yet there's an invitation for you and me to be a part of the story. You look at the scripture, John 14, 12, Jesus said it himself. John 14, 12 said this, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, even greater works, because I'm going to go, with the, go to be the Father. Jesus says, look, can you, don't let that verse of scripture, God says, you're going to do even greater works than me. I'm going to my Father, and I'm, I'm inviting you. I'm telling you that it's not over when the book of Revelation ended. And it's not over when I went back to heaven. We just got to wait till Jesus Christ comes back. We just kind of do our life. Jesus said, I've got something. I'm inviting you to be a part of the story, and you're going to do even greater things than I have done. Do we believe that? We don't a lot of times. Well, Jesus said, oh, man, I've got to kind of wait until it happens. No, God's saying, hey, get off your seats. Quit playing the religious game. Quit just being so selfish and self-focused. I've got a, I'm Jesus, I'm inviting you to be a part of the greatest story that will ever be told. And if you trust me and you step out in faith and step out of your boat and get real with me, you will do greater things than even those have been recorded here that I've done. You say, well, I don't know. I didn't say it. Jesus said, I think he understands. Let me end with this. This is one of my most inspirational scriptures. Anytime I feel like down, I don't know if I can do it. This is the scripture I go to. <clears throat> Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, by the way, if you ever get there, just read all the way through. Hebrews 11 is kind of like the chapter that kind of summarizes every great story in the Bible. It's like the who's who of the awesome things of the Bible, right? If you want to look at Hebrews 11, it's kind of a kind of hall of faith chapter. And it says in 11, we're going to start in verse 32. We have that, Michael. How, and this is after he's gone through a lot of things about people doing great things. He finally says this. How much more do I need to say? It would take me too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David, of Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions and quenched the flames of fire. They escaped death by the edge of the sword. They, th their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from the dead, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and others, their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed by the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute, oppressed, and mistreated. Y'all with me here? This is, this is kind of like the wrap-up. This is like, here's the story. These great things that happened. These people that shut the mouth of lions, that quenched the fire. People who were persecuted and killed because they did not give up for Jesus. They were too, I love this verse, they were too good for this world. Wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet, none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that we would not reach perfection, that they would not reach perfection without us. Do you, do you get that part? All these great, powerful stories that we can sit around a campfire and just be like, wow. 
And God said, they didn't, they didn't get to, God held back a little bit for them. He's given you an invitation to the story. And that's why the very next verse in Hebrews 12, 1 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses, do you understand that your life is surrounded by every great man and woman who ever died or lived for Jesus Christ? And they're cheering you on. They know it's hard. They've been beaten. They've been oppressed. They said, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses of the faith, let us strip every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily strips us, or trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. The story is not over. There is still more to the story to be written. And God has personally asked you and me to join into the story. He's like, come. These great things these people did, the story's not over. So now you see what they've done? They passed the baton to you. How will you live your life for Him? There's a crowd surrounding you say, go, run. Don't let sin trip you up anymore. Don't let guilt, don't let the world distract you. Don't let your own selfish desires drown you. Understand there's a far greater story that no matter what the ups and downs of life look like and no matter how we get distracted by our own trinkets and own things, there's a story that's been woven that cannot be touched by man, that cannot be uh, ended by man. No matter how bad or good it gets, there's a story that spoke into existence in the beginning and will move to the very day when Jesus Christ comes back and the story is complete. You and me, right now, we're in it. We're in it. Wherever you find yourself, 18, 20, 45, 65, wherever you find yourself, in whatever area of life you're in, you can know one thing, you're a part of the story. Will you embrace your part of the story? There's something worth fighting for. And this is why we say, Radius, we'll move out in ever-widening circles to change this world because we will seek to be the tangible, visible evidence of Jesus and His love to St. Petersburg. We are going to take our place in the grand story. And I, I don't know where I plead, I encourage, I, I seek to help you understand that God's got your name and wants you to write the story, be a part of the story. We take a step of faith and join. Let's pray.